just smell like booze, I'm a wimp. My glasses are real thick and my breath would make you sick, I'm a wimp. I've got teeth like a squirrel, never make love to a girl, I'm a wimp. I am into electronics and believe in economics, I'm a wimp. He's a wimp, he's a wimp, he's a stupid jerk, he's a wimp, a wimp. Skid marked underwear, I'm a wimp. I think Donahue is a commie. I still live with my mommy, I'm a wimp. I've never taken drugs, but I'm into collecting bugs, I'm a wimp. When I'm feeling blue, I just bundle my apple too. I'm a wimp. He's a wimp, he's a wimp, he's a stupid jerk. He's a wimp, a wimp. He's a wimp, he's a wimp, he's a stupid jerk. He's a wimp. Maybe if we sold your mother to the foreign slave traders, it might help our attitude. Okay. What'd you say about my mother? What's the matter? That thing just sits on my desk and stares at me with that idiotic blinking light on the screen. Computers, they're here to stay. Technology will replace you. So what? Why is it that men understand computers so easily and women don't? There was a woman in the 1840s who worked with computers. That should be some kind of encouragement for him. What if I do something wrong? Make a copy of this a copy of this still oh, copy I didn't of this copy of this still I proceeded to the photocopy. <laughs> 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 What's up, Nards? My mom's on the net. He's a wimp.
wimp. He's a wimp. He's a stupid jerk. I wish you were jerk. here, Ada. He's a wimp. This is like a, a bad dream. Whether this is a dream or reality be. for your mind is something you'll have to answer for yourself. I have but an why? Open as well. It is your choice, open really. Chat. I can be, perhaps, a window to help up. you see better into the computer realm. Or I can let you return to that hideous mm. place you just came from. Please don't. Let's reflect upon a few things through the mind's eye. All right. A computer is All a tool, right, like doing? a knife, a wrench, a parasol, get rid a of tea cup. Nonsense! Get this nonsense out of the way. Hot topics. Hope you brought your Jinko jeans. The legs of mine are soiled with filth. Did you ever have Jinko jeans? And the legs soiled with filth. Because of rain. Don't step, in Don't step in the puddles. Don't put the pee pee in the poo poo. <laughs> oh, welcome, baby. Welcome. Tonight's opening ditty. Um, if you watched, thank you, Robert. Yes, we will be taking questions tonight, you guys. Welcome, everybody. Middle of the day stream. We're doing it Jay's analysis style today. There's me. Turn around, look at what you see in her face. The mirror of your dreams, make believe I'm everywhere. Given in the light, written on the pages, is the answer to a never-ending Hollywood repackaged remake. Stranger things, stranger things, stranger things. Don't touch the stranger's thing. Ah, ah, ah. Rhymes that keep. No, wait. Reach the stars. Fly a fantasy. Dream a dream. And what you see will be. In the repackaging of the repackaging of the repackaging. Ah, 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 ah. E.T. plus John Carpenter plus everything from the 80s. Ah, 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 ah. Really gay. The show is really gay. <laughs> A stranger's thing. Poo poo pee pee. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I watch Stranger Things. <laughs> and nerds are not wimps, by the way. Nerds are not wimps. So I got some notes. We're going to talk about Stranger Things. We're going to talk about Folk Magic Wicker Man and the repackaged Wicker Man, known as Midsommar. Midsommar, would you like to come to my version of Burning Man where we put you inside a giant peter mood and burn you down? Yeah, it's very fun. Yordy, yordy, yordy. Swedish Chef. Did you know Swedish Chef was in a death cult? Pee pee poo, poo poo pee pee. The mouth of Venus is greater than the. Wait, no, the. The eye of Horus. Over poo poo pee 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 pee. You have to know Tristan. That's the Tristan remix of the Stranger Things version of the Never Ending Story song. If you watch Stranger Things. It's not all madness tonight. We will be talking about, again, these films. Crazy news stories that I saw this week. Get down, chubs. Get down, chubs. I love you, KJ. I'm just joking. So it's a, it's a KJ-esque show this week. Hey guys, get down, Chubs. Chubs, get down. <laughs> That's an homage to KJ. If you get impersonated by Jay, you know that I like you. And we impersonate everybody around here. Yes, everybody everybody likes the Jay remix of the Tristan version of the Stranger Things installment of the Never Any Story. I got to pay Tristan royalties every time I do the pee pee in the poo poo. Hey, Chubbs, get down, Chubbs. Chubbs, get down. 
Uh, anyway, so yeah, I uh, hope you guys saw the movies this week, Stranger Things, Midsommar, Folk Magic, Wicker Man, and uh, I did get to do some interviews that are going to relate to Folk Magic, and that's secret stuff in the pipe, in the pike, in the pipe, whatever that means, in the pike, down the pipe. All right, we're not going to get too dirty. But the first dumb thing I saw was in the news today, directly related to what I just did last week's subscribers talk on. Look at this. 400,000 dum-dums pledge an Area 51 raid. There's no aliens at Area 51, dummy. The only thing you're going to find at Area 51 is maybe giant piles of cocaine. Because they did find a giant billion dollar pile of cocaine being shipped in crates to Spain this week. And I think that was from Bolsonaro, wasn't it? Based Bolsonaro shipping that coke. Or it was from his country, if I recall. Isn't that right? But look at these dumb dumbs. 400,000 Facebook users. Only Facebook users would pledge this. An army of Area 51 invaders... Signing up to storm you <laughs> Area 51, the alien research facility. There's no aliens there, dum-dums. And if you watch the Bob Laser video, uh, this is probably staged in concert with that stuff, right? The Joe Rogan, Bob Laser, Bob Lizard fake documentary thing that I covered last week. And then this is in the news. They are, why is all this alien stuff back? I guess the alien stuff was dying, it was less popular. Who really believes in aliens? Are they repackaging this for the millennial age or the Gen Z? Do they believe in aliens? What evidence is there for aliens? None at all. Over 400,000 people committed to this event. And <laughs> let's see them aliens. <laughs> I love how they worded this. Let's see them aliens. Yo, dog, let's see them aliens. Is this like, uh, well, I won't use that word. That's a no-no word. Attendees are supposedly meeting at a nearby tourist attraction where they will coordinate entry. There have been 21,000 posts about the event and the game plans to siege the base with formations of rock throwers. They're going to throw rocks at this old decommissioned base or whatever it is. Area 51 is a facility near Groom Lake, Nevada, run by the Air Force. Oh, yeah, they're going to throw rocks at the Air Force. <laughs> uh, it is linked to alien conspiracy theories since the testing of a spy plane in 1955, with this, which the CIA first shed light on. And MJ-12 is, of course, written by a bunch of disinformation goofuses. It's obviously nonsense. But all these goofballs are about to find that out firsthand. So, this is the week of vindication, isn't it? For Jay's analysis. This is a week of nothing but vindication. How do I say goodbye to all the hay haters? The good times in the bad. I don't even know that dumb boys to men song, but I've been singing it all day. How do I say goodbye to all the haters? I've been had haters all up my butt this week. Haters all up my butt. Better get out of there, punks. Haters all up my butt this week. Better get out, punks. All right. Thank you for all these super chats. You guys are way too generous this week. Um, what else did I see that I wanted to talk about before we get into our movies this week? Um, gobbledygook. No, we're not going to talk about gobbledygook. But let's see. Oh, I wanted to tell Nick Cage stories real quick. 
So when we went to New Orleans, right before it flooded, like I was telling you guys on Boiler Room, we went to Lorie Mabeau, Marie Laveau, Lorene Laveau. There's pretty Jamie there. Look at what she next to. The tomb of these pictures on that fancy camera are gigantic. She's next to the tomb of, I always say it wrong, La Vie Marie Laveau. Let's see what this says. By the way, there's a bunch of offerings in front of her voodoo thing, too. This is, this Greek revival tomb is reputed to be the burial of the notorious voodoo queen of a mystic cult. Voodooism, that's the name of her cult. She could have gotten more creative than that. What you want to call your cult? Voodooism. African origins was brought to this, was brought? Oh, the cult of African origins was brought to this city from Santo Domingo and flourished in the 19th century. Marie Laveau was the most widely known of many practitioners of the cult. Interesting. So we got to go see that. And it's right next. That's not right next to. It's like adjacent a few tombs down. A few tombs down from Nick. Right? So Nick's cage. <laughs> Nick's cage is down. What do you call it? Two, three death blocks down from Marie Laveau. These giant pictures. Got to make them small. Yeah, I know we talked about this in Boiler Room, but there was more to the story I didn't get to in Boiler Room I wanted to tell you. All right. So then you see here, me, I did actually go. I finally went to Nick's future tomb. Somebody said, is Nicholas Cage dead? No, dude. Nicholas Cage can never die. But in case he actually did ever die, there is this giant pyramid tomb that he bought, and he thinks he's cursed by Marie Laveau, and that's why he's had bad movie times. But his movies are not that bad. Do you think he's cursed by the other Oh, I'm sorry. He thinks he's cursed by LaLaurie. So he's trying to side with Marie Laveau? Yeah. Oh, he's trying to get Marie Laveau's help from beyond the grave to battle in this spiritual <laughs> battle with with the LaLaurie's because Nick Cage bought somebody's house, LaLaurie house, or did he buy the Marie Laveau's? LaLaurie. Okay. So he bought the LaLaurie house. Anyway, whatever. I don't watch American Horror Story, but it dealt with some of this a few seasons back. If you recall, if you watch that crazy show. Now, what I wanted to also bring up that I didn't get to on Le Boiler Room Le boiler room in the city, les dégénérants, les dégénérants, les dégénérants. <laughs> For the French speakers out there, that means degenerates in French. Les dégénérants. This movie, this was a crazy uh, Laurel Canyon tie-in that I did not expect in this boomer classic. Have you noticed that you can't find, it's like they're getting rid of original movie posters? Because every time you search, they give you the modern crappy DVD covers for everything. And you have to specifically put in original poster. I wonder if there's some reason that this is happening. Why is there a war on original posters? So anyway, if you've seen Boomer Rider, there's a scene where they, uh, Dennis Hopper and Fonda, I think. Yeah, they sneak into this graveyard because it's walled off and you're supposed to have a, a tour guide to go in there. So in Boomer Rider, they get out and they hop the fence and they filmed a whole scene in there and Dennis Hopper is legit tripping balls in that scene. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and then, 
supposedly, this was the tour guide's tale. I'm not sure if I believe it, but the tour guide's tale was that from this point on, Hollywood would have uh, Catholic cemeteries would not allow Hollywood to film there because supposedly Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda violated this by tripping acid and filming Boomer Rider there. But uh, Easy Rider is a Laurel Canyon type, not that great movie. Anyway, very interesting little factoid there. Also, we went to, as I was mentioning on Willow Room, if you've not seen Bad Lieutenant, and I'm not like a huge uh, Werner Herzog film guy. He made that one by the way, not the Harvey Keitel Bad Lieutenant. <laughs> this is Bad Lieutenant Port of Call. Uh, do you remember when Werner Herzog a couple years ago made that terrible movie with Lawrence Krauss in it as playing Lawrence Krauss? Ugh. And Michael Shannon was in it. It was all about green crap. It was total nonsense. Anyway, so we went to this bar. I can't, I don't know what, I guess Port of Call is just a port. I don't know, but I'm not an expert on New Orleans. I was only there to pass through. People keep asking, what are you doing in New Orleans all the time? Why are you always there? It's because I love Le Degeneracy. De I am Le Degeneracy. I can't get enough of Le Degeneracy. Anyway, so there was this little dive bar steakhouse called Port of Call. So I thought, is that related to this title of this film? Which I had not yet seen. This was on the way back out there a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. And the steakhouse was, it was all right. You can look up port call Steakhouse down in the French Quarter on the edge of it. And I asked the waitress, I said, is this restaurant related to Bad Lieutenant port of call And she said, no, we were here before that movie. I said, I know that you didn't name your restaurant after the movie. Duh. I'm asking you if, do you know if the title of the film had anything to do with this place? And she said, oh, I don't know, but Nicolas Cage is forever banned from this restaurant. I said, what? What? How dare you? And she said, he had too many episodes. And I said, well... Well, any place not fit for Nicholas is not fit for me. That's my feelings on the subject. I'm kidding. I did go ahead and eat my steak there, but I was told that you can't come in there if you're Nick. And I said, what about the world's greatest Nick Cage impersonator? She said, uh, okay, we'll let you have a steak, but you can't drink. And I was like, I don't drink, so ain't nothing to worry about. Okay, that didn't really happen, but close enough, close enough. Uh, I think that was all the cage tales I had. It was, it was interesting, though. If you've not been to New Orleans, I, I would not recommend. Oh, the other crazy story was that, so in Bad Lieutenant, which does have some esoteric stuff, and I know some of y'all recommended an analysis of it, and that's partly why I watched it. I thought, oh, maybe I could do an analysis of this, but... I'm not sure what it means. Is he just a reptilian type of person? I don't mean David Icke type reptilian. I just mean the way Stefan talks about the reptile brain, the monkey brain, the monkey brain, the reptile brain, you know, that kind of a thing. He's reptilian in his attitude. And that's why he ends up getting, I'm not going to spoil the movie if you haven't seen it. It is actually it is a good movie. I thought it was very entertaining, very funny, very a lot of irony, a lot of goofiness, a lot of crazy Nick Cage going on. And this was kind of the last. I think it was critically. I think no, maybe it was critically bombed. Anyway, it's actually a good movie. And then I think he had that spate of kind of ones that people weren't too big fans of. Um, however, Joe is really good. If you've not seen Joe with Nick Cage, it's really good. And then Mandy, of course, kind of put Nick back on top but um it was just really weird that 
bad lieutenant was set during Hurricane Katrinka, and then after that, two weeks later, on the way back to Florida, literally the morning of being in New Orleans, it flooded. Two days ago, New Orleans was crazy flooded, and we barely got out at 7 in the morning. It was insane. It was the craziest weather situation I've ever been in, and they had water tornadoes. And somebody said, they're called spouts. They're not called water tornadoes. I'm, Dude, I know that, but nobody knows what a spout is. A spout sounds like a tiny little bubbling gay fountain. This was not a tiny little bubbling gay fountain of beauty and pleasure. This was giant water tornadoes while there was flooding. I've never seen anything like this. I'm walking through the streets with water all the way up your ankles at seven in the morning. And by the way, that's before it got really bad at nine in the morning. We were gone by then. And I did not, I thought I'm not getting out of here. I'm stuck in this. I wasn't worried I was going to drown and float away because Nick Cage could drop, jump, dive in and save me. I was worried about being stuck there in Hurricane Katrinka Deuce. Hurricane, excuse me, Katrina Part Dieu. <laughs> there you go, because it's French. Get it? Hurricane Katrina Part Dieu. And I'm not making light of flooding, and it's awful. It was a water tornado. I know they're called spouts or sprouts or whatever gay term they use, but it was no joke, dude. This stuff was legit. So that was an adventure. That was the crazy. I've been in a tornado one other time, and it kind of went overhead. I mean, I wasn't like in the house when the tornado wasn't no Dorothy. Dorothy Gale. It wasn't nothing like that. But it was bad enough, and the tornado actually did touch down not too far from where I was back in my hometown in about 2001 or two. There was, uh, but anyway, if you live in Tennessee, you used to t tornadoes. We have tornadoes all the time, uh, and they can be pretty frightening. But you know, most of the, maybe every year there's 40 deaths, you know, out of millions of people from tornadoes. So it's not like a real thing you're afraid of but when you're there is a tornado you do have to be in a state of precaution and flooding last uh two days ago in, in in new orleans was crazy and by the time so like two hours after we got out of new orleans i was watching all the pictures and the images coming through and you know cars were flooded like uh, all the way up the door of the car some of the cars were underwater right where we were let me see if I can find a picture of this. This is crazy. I know. This is a, we don't ever talk about this kind of stuff. You know, weather? Who talks about the weather? Nobody. But Well, where's the picture? Oh, here we go. So when we woke up, it looked like well, damn it, I can't find the pictures now. I sent like a million pictures. Oh, here we go. So this was literally what was going on right outside the city at Lake Pontchartrain. Look at that. That's crazy. We're driving past that. And I'm like, is this the end of the world? What is going on? And then... Meanwhile, what was going on in town was this. Look at this. This is what we narrowly avoided. Where'd my picture go? This. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? And 
I woke up and I was, it was the loudest thunderstorm I've ever heard. And I'm like, it's time to get out of this place. Because everybody remembers Katrinka, the hellishness of Hurricane Katrinka. I hate it when these pictures don't translate over into OBS. Anyway, you get the idea. It was like that. So all that was going on at the same time. And uh, it was the most extreme weather I've, event I've been in. And I was sitting there thinking, I wonder if they're... Oh, yeah, this is, this is what I saw trying to get out. And this is when I was thinking, we're stuck, dude. We are stuck. We are not getting out of here. It was an adventure, man. Adventure time. You got to see this picture. This is the last one. I'll stop weather posting because I know the kids don't like it. He just weather posts all the time on his streams. It's so boring. It's like, dude, is this like the Weather Channel? What is this? There is boomer posting, shit posting, and now I'm weather posting. <sighs> Come on, dude. Here we go. So when we were trying to, I'm trying to leave, and it's like, look at that. Ah! I'm like, oh, dude, I'm stuck in voodoo land. And I'm going to get voodoo curses put on me. Anyway. And yeah, started praying. Thank God I got out of that. Got out of that nonsense. All right, so let's move on. Um, keep me in your prayers. Because we have weather of mass destruction. Esoteric Hollywood 2 available at Jay's Analysis. Get signed copies there. Caught up on everybody's orders, by the way. Uh, so everybody should be getting theirs mailed out. If it was a little bit behind, I apologize. I was in Texas. And what were we doing? Well, I got a little surprise. Got a little secret. Got a little secret for you. We were filming. Um, I was filming with Aaron and Melissa. It's going to be awesome. But I can't say what we were talking about because that's secrets. Secret stuff. Anyway. But it'll be cool. So look for that in the near future. Documentary stuff. And also, I got to meditate and spend some time with Tom. Um, we're going to take just a little brief minute here. And we're going to meditate quietly on this photo. This beautiful artwork that someone did in honor of Hollywood. You're all going to meditate with me. I want you to breathe out your thetans. Breathe out the thetans. Breathe in the L. Ron Hubbard. Breathe in your Hubbards. Hold it. Hold it. Hold your Tom. Hold your Toms. And then I want you to just crew. I want you to bring in the Toms. Hold your toms. Hold your toms. And then just cruise. <laughs> and then do a little Tom Cruise lap. All right, we did our Hollywood meditation for the day. Uh, I didn't get to meet anybody famous. Oh, I was supposed to meet somebody famous on this trip. And I got friend zoned. <laughs> I won't say who. But I got friends on, but that's okay. I still am a nerd, and I had nerd gear. I was gonna get to meet somebody, but maybe next time, maybe in the near future. I got I got Holly cucked. <laughs> anyway, signed copies of Esther Hollywood at Jay's analysis. So and and now that I'm back home, uh, we're gonna pick back up, catch up with the tutoring. A lot of people asking how how do I do your tutoring thing. The Patreon is the easiest way to do that. Uh, if you sign up at Patreon, I do tutoring, philosophy, geopolitics, whatever you want to talk about. Um, most of the time, it tends to be people wanting to do philosophy tutoring. So uh, the easiest way is Patreon. It doesn't have to be, be Patreon, but it's kind of set up for the tiers if you want to do it that way. Um, and it's twice a month, typically. But we can work around your schedule. It's that easy. All you got to do, if you go to Jay's Analysis, there's a Patreon link. Go sign up at Patreon if you want to do the tutoring. 
If you want to do tutoring a different way, just send me an email. Uh, for the boomers and those that have a, a hard time with my website, it is structured to be as simple as possible. So I got several messages this week, people confused about where the members content is. There's a tab at the top when you log in and it says members section. All you have to do is click that tab. Everything in the members section is on one page. That's all you got to do. Very, very simple. Made it easy for the boomers. I love my boomers. I'm not hating on them. I'm just saying. Made it easy for them. And that's all you got to do. Uh, and I want to make that clear. So now we understand it's not it's not difficult. Real easy. I'm not making fun of you guys. I love you guys. Um, wow. 300 in the middle of the day. Well, kind of in the middle of the day. We'll say it's in the middle of the day. It's the middle of the day somewhere. <laughs> Dad joke. It's 420 somewhere. <laughs> it's happy hour somewhere. <laughs> How many versions of that dumb joke are there? Too many. Did Jay make fun of millennials now? Uh, uh, hey, like, will you, uh, come pay my bill? Hey, dad, like, uh, will you, like, come open my blinds because like I'm a millennial and everything is supposed to be like done for me or whatever. Hey, uh, grandpa, will you like give me my inheritance now and just die or whatever? Uh, Hey, <laughs> uh, mom, I'm playing video games cause I'm like on Twitch now. And, uh, could you pay the rent? Hey, uh, like how do you pay a bill or whatever? <clears throat> How's that? And then topped it off with a belch. So somebody asked for making fun of millennials. There was a request to make fun of millennials. So there was my millennial posting. Um, thank you for all these super chats, man. You guys are being gracious. Y'all's being gracious. You wanna have you ever heard Ray Stevens? <laughs> Ray Stevens is the ultimate not funny boomer comedy. Watch Ray Stevens like see this, and he'll be a fan, and then I'll be then I'll be having to suck up to Ray Stevens. Oh, it was all in your fun. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Ray Stevens is not funny, and man, those videos. I watched a couple of those because if you grew up in Tennessee, then you know, or in the South, you know who Ray Stevens is. Uh, it is boomer evangelical humor. That's like a tier above boomer jokes. Boomer stand up. I was watching a boomer stand up the other day and it reminded me of Foster Brooks. Foster Brooks is boomer humor and it is not funny. It's just so funny to me that different generations have different senses of humor. That's what I'm getting at here. It's just, it's, it's funny to me. What's not funny is what I'm saying. And Foster Brooks is not funny. Just like Danny Gans. Remember Danny Gans? Everything is terrible. Uploaded the Danny Gans clip. And it was boomer humor. Uh, this is funny now. Like all these 90s comedians that I used to watch when I was a kid in the 90s and I wanted to be a comedian. I'm like, man, these guys are, this is cringe, dude. Boomer humor. So, yeah, so Ray Stevens is a funny one to look up because he sings the song about the, <laughs> the squirrel that causes a revival. <laughs> that day the squirrel went berserk. In the first of righteous church of Pascagoula, it was a fight for survival that broke out in revival. <laughs> That's why they call him the streak. Boogity, boogity. It's, oh, it's like, oh, dude. So if you've not seen Ray Stevens, go watch the streak. <laughs> watch the squirrel revival and see which one you think is worse. I kind of think the streak about the streaker is worse than the squirrel revival, but they they're both cringe tier, dude. And then uh, compare him to Foster Brooks, who is his whole shtick was just being drunk and telling drunk jokes for however many decades. Oh, this, is, this is Foster Brooks, and he does this routine where he says. Uh, I've been, I'm completely loaded tonight, but I have a good reason. It was because I've been drinking all day. 
Foster Brooks, everybody. Foster Brooks. So already we got the theology super chats pouring in. They're like, please stop talking about <laughs> boomer jokes. Anyway, boomer humor, Danny Gans, Foster Brooks, and Ray Stevens. See who's the worst of those three. It's a it's a close battle. Yeah, I'll get to the super chats here in a bit. Uh, I might read them at the end. I might read some in the middle. We'll see. But Let's move on now to talk about where do we want to start? Do we want to talk about Stranger Things or Midsummer? Midsummer and Wicker Man. Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee. Wicker Man. Wicker. Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. If you've not seen Christopher Lee in Wicker Man, he has wine mom hair. Let me see your manager. He's got let me see your manager here. I'm not joking. Christopher Lee in Wicker Man. We'll go there because he's got, he's literally got let me see your manager here. You know that hairdo that is in memes and shit? Uh, we got to find a good picture, yeah, where he's kind of frozen. Oh, yeah, here we go. So you thought that, that hairdo comes from somebody who works in a salon. <laughs> Some bitch who works in a salon. No. It starts with Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee is who got single moms wearing that hairdo, feeling like they had the gumption to talk to your manager. And then I realized Christopher Lee is quite literally a wine mom in this movie. It's, it should be called Wine Man. Wine Mom Man. Wicker, wicker Wine Mom. <laughs> wicker Wine Mom. Let me see your manager. Let's find a good... You know, and when you... Let's see. When you type in wine, wine Mom, you just get pictures of wine. You don't get Wine Moms. Here we go. Wine Mom. Uh, tonight's forecast... 99% chance of wine mom. <laughs> Look at this one. She doesn't really have the hairdo, though. Wine mom. <laughs> Christopher Lee looks like somebody's grandma, dude. Of course, he does dress up like a woman. Uh, because part of the festival in Wicker Man includes... Ooh. The mom in Arrested Development. Boom. That's a great wine mom. Miss Bluth. She's a wine mom. Um, let me see your manager me. Yeah, dude. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty close. I mean, it's kind of what Christopher Lee was going for here. We're in the we're roughly in the vicinity of Christopher Lee. Let me see your manager. I demand a blood sacrifice. Anyway, all right, enough of this stuff. <clears throat> so let's go, we'll go next to, we'll do some Wicker Man now. Because we got into Christopher Lee. So Midsommar, Midsommar is literally a representation of Wicker Man. Like down to really obvious degree level so so let's start with wicker man because we never did actually do a full analysis of wicker man and i meant to for a long time so we'll do this and by the way i'm also going to do uh, a fancy video with all of my little fancy effects from my final cut program on wicker man and midsummer because there's a lot of imagery and stuff we want to compare but i also wanted to just kind of touch on it on the stream as we talk about crazy stuff uh, so they're worshiping the sun. The first thing we see is that this is a solar religion. And a lot of the ancient pagan religions are centered around solar worship. But what's interesting is that the Christian character who is the... There's alarms going off. The Christian character who is the cop, who's the fool in this one, the sacrifice, he's taking communion at the beginning. And I see this as a foreshadowing 
this is a foreshadowing that he is going to be the sacrifice like Christ is the sacrifice. You know what I mean? Uh, now, I've seen Word Command several times, but I didn't notice that until this last viewing. And by the way, the Nicolas Cage Word Command is great fun. I don't know why anybody hates on that movie. It's so much fun. And I did a whole analysis of the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man in the Nicolas Cage voice. So you should appreciate that. And I know you guys do. So, but Wicker Man, Wick, Wick, Wicky, Wick, Wick, Wicky, Wicker Leaks, a wick is a witch. Do you know that's another word for witch wick wicker witch man so he has to take communion because it's foreshadowing that he is the sacrifice and then so he goes to the island we know he's looking for rowan whatever her name is the girl that has supposedly disappeared in the movie uh this is all a ruse so by the way if you've not seen wicker man there will be spoilers but it's interesting because it is pretty illuminate confirmed. I mean, this is a uh, you know, you know, it's it, it's a creepy movie, especially for its time. You know, seventies folk horror stuff can be creepy at times. So, by the way, it's this is in the vein of you know what I did last uh, a couple weeks ago. What I did the uh, to the devil a daughter video. It, Christopher Lee is in every one of these. Every one of these folk horror films. It's got Christopher Lee in it. Devil Rides Out, which is in Esoteric Hollywood 1. To the Devil a Daughter, just made that video. Wicker Man. Satanic Rites of Dracula. Christopher Lee, right? Then we see, uh, as he's on the island, right, and he's a dupe, the cop, he's kind of wandering around. Uh, and he's supposed to be a cop, but he's not very good because... Every possible red flag is present there to tell him what's going on, and he doesn't seem to catch on. I guess because of his naivety, right? He's too naive. He can't figure out that people are doing this stuff. Which is appropriate because in our day, this stuff goes on, and people can't figure out that it goes on. And hence, we get called tinfoil hat crazy people for many, many years, even though now this week's news has nothing but completely vindicated everything that we've talked about for a long long time where's all my apologies this week all the people all the haters over the last 10 years and then the news this week epstein and all that come on so what we see is the idea that he's going to be the sacrifice there's human cakes present they have cakes made in the shape of humans which is uh this old pagan tradition they make they break uh john barleycorn they bake bread in the shape of a dude to eat remember when will ferrell was with marina abramovich cutting up human cakes with lady gaga that is a pagan right and we have references to demeter to orpheus to those mysteries of you know, nature going through the cyclical process of death and then return and rebirth. This is what all pagan religions do, is the, they deify and they apotheosize nature. They attribute personal characteristics to nature in its various forms and functions, strata and species. So every aspect of nature sort of takes on a hypostasis, a person. That is what polytheism is. So he is going to be a sacrifice for Aphrodite, we learn. And not just Aphrodite, but in the end scene, Christopher Lee actually says that it's an offering to the mother goddess and to the sun god, to the male and the female principles, right? The, 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 the earth is, of course, Gaia, the feminine principle, the sun, Apollos, the logos, the uh, masculine principle. I'm not saying the sun is logos. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the way that these pagan religions like Marcus Aurelius, what he, the way he viewed Logos, right, would be like Apollo, would be like sun religion, reason, rationality, order. 
And then you have the nighttime, lunar, lunatic, crazy, Dionysian stuff, you see. Nature is itself God. And this goes back to the ancient, ancient pagan concepts and ultimately to the garden. This is essentially the original lie of Satan in Genesis that man is God, nature is God, the world is God, you are God. So then we see the maypole and the kids dancing around that pole, singing that goofy, goofy song. And on that man there was a girl, and on that girl there was some funk, and on that funk there was a tree, and on that tree there was an egg, and on that egg there was some butter, and on that butter there was some spice, and on that spice there was some drugs, and on that drug there was some cooking, and on that cooking there was a, I don't know. It just goes crazy, but I don't remember the song. But you notice they have, they have a rope tied to their area, to the maypole, and they all dance around it, and then they're like, Ugh. if you remember that scene. And then he walks over to the class, and they're explaining that this is the phallus, the P-H-A-L-L-U-S. And that's because they're worshiping the generative principle. Most of the pagan religions, because of the deification of nature, worship the patterns of nature as they are now. This is the root problem, as I've stressed many, many times, why we can't do natural theology. We cannot look at the natural world and assume from the state that it is presently after the fall to reasoning up to God, because when we do that, we get the conclusion that death is a natural process. The world as it is now is not how God intended it. So, yes, of course, nature reveals God. I'm not saying that the natural world doesn't reveal God. But what I'm saying is that the reason we can't do natural theology is that this world as it is cannot be properly interpreted and understood without the doctrine of the fall. The doctrine of the fall is a doctrine of revealed theology. That means that it requires revelation to interpret the natural world. That's why Thomism doesn't work. How many times do I have to state that to you Thomists? If I try to do natural theology, it leads me to natural law theory, and God gets excluded because the world that's out there is chaotic, it's primal, and it's parasitical. It's not natural. So people equivocate on the word natural and nature because it has many different senses and different contexts, and they get confused. And then when they read church fathers in the East that talk about natural law or natural revelation, they think that it's the exact same thing that Aquinas is talking about. No, it's not. St. Maximus the Confessor's doctrine is not the same as Aquinas' doctrine. And by the way, there's a whole book on this by Pelican. Orthodox Dogmatics, Volume 1, explains why orthodoxy does not believe in Thomistic natural law theory. When you look out at the world as it is now, the reigning principle in this world is death. Paul says in Romans 8 that the creation was subjected to corruption. It's not in its truly natural state. That's why, as St. Maximus says, there's nothing more natural to man than grace. Did you hear that, Catholics? There's nothing more natural to man than grace. That flies in the face of Thomism. And then really, it's quite simple. If you just stop and think about it, the world, as it is now, is a cycle of life and death. Death is not natural. Death is not good. Death entered through the fall. So the world as it is now is in a state of corruption and decay, Romans 8, and it, it will be repaired through the resurrection of Christ, which has a cosmic dimension Allah, Maximus the Confessor, and all the Eastern Fathers. But you cannot understand the natural world as it is without the doctrine of creation and the fall. The doctrine of the fall presupposes creation, does it not? Of course it does. That, it makes no sense. So if those two things are presupposed, then you have to understand revelation, revealed doctrine, creation and fall, to properly interpret the present world of decay and death that's out there. If you don't do that, 
and I look out at the natural world and I see a bunch of decay and death and I say that this is a natural process and God designed it that way, then I end up with psychopathic God who can't design things very well and nature being a parasitical, psychotic process. This is what happens in the Enlightenment in their process of reasoning from absolute simplicity in scholasticism to the deists of the Enlightenment. They're just following the logical train of argumentation from an absolutely simple super essence that you can't know except through created causal effects in the world. Anyway, you can't know directly. You can only know through created effects. So then we see that everything is a, a circling around this cyclical process of the maypole. The maypole is the phallus and the generative principle. Uh, and then we see the uh, reference to the egg and the snake, which is from Plato's Timaeus. That's how the universe is described as the egg and the snake. The Ouroboros with the egg. What's the egg? The feminine principle. What's the snake? You know what? Whoop. Right? The maypole. We see uh, the maypole is also the tree of life, right? So the tree and the seed and then, the you know, again, the generative process. And what's interesting is that they talk about right away, he's like, why aren't you burying your dead? And why is the graveyard on this island all weird? And they say, because we believe in reincarnation, not resurrection. Now, when Jesus interprets the natural world, he says that it teaches principles like resurrection. He doesn't say anything about transmigration of souls or reincarnation. That's because we don't believe that. There's no place for transmigration of souls in our worldview. But, interestingly, Christopher Lee explains to the cop, the Christian policeman, that uh, being the fool that you are, we do have some of your doctrines, such as parthenogenesis. He talks about a virgin birth because he sees naked women jumping over fire. And he says, sir, why are there naked women in your village jumping over fire? <laughs> and he says, they are seeking to be virginally inseminated. Sir, we believe in a virgin birth like you, but not the same type of virgin birth. Hmm. So the sun symbol, by the way, where then, so then we see this weird scene where he's being pre prepped for the sacrifice and there's a six pointed hexagram that he almost gets his head lopped off. Remember that part, which is interesting because the star of Rim fan in the Septuagint, if I recall, mentions it as a human sacrifice cult. So it's almost as if on the Scottish Island in the narrative, there is the maintenance of this hexagonal human sacrifice cult which makes sense because saturn in saturn worship sat saturn saturn set satan worship and then we see the animal masks humans reduced to the level of just being bestial animals right and you see this by the way everywhere in pop culture you go to costume stores, you look online, people are wearing horse heads, they're wearing all these animal costumes, they think they're furries, people losing their damn mind, you're not an animal, you're not a chipmunk, you don't mate with chipmunks. Anyway. Over and over and over, he doesn't see any red flags. He's supposed to understand that he's the rabbit. So you see this white rabbit motif, right? Like he's chasing the white, the white rabbit all through the island. Uh, he's being hunted. He is, I guess, John Barleycorn. I don't, I'd never heard of John Barleycorn until I was looking into this even deeper. We see the uh, mixing of the sexes in this rite of Dionysian abandon. You have to return to primal chaos which is the blending and inversion of everything. So everything, I think it's inverted and turned around. And that is supposed to re reduce us to a primitive state of chaos in order for there to be regeneration. This is the belief and purpose of the rites, such as Wicker Man. That's what this rite is about. Uh, Burning Man. Hello? Burning Man. Rites of confusion and inversion is what this is. So Burning Man then is a 
King Kill Ritual, if you've read The Golden Bough by Frazier, you know that early on in the book he talks about the King Kill Ritual, which is the death of the king, the death of, because this is believed then to bless the crops. There you go. So burning, burning man, man. <laughs> Burn the man, man. <laughs> yeah, man, you gotta like uh, fight the system. They're trying to keep us down, man, and they're not letting us be free to sacrifice each other, man. Uh, they're trying to keep us down. Uh. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I just swallowed a bunch of mushrooms. <coughs> This drink has mushrooms in it. I'm not eating. I'm not eating mushrooms, man. You like my boomer deadhead stoner voice? Boomer deadhead stoner. Living on pills, vitamin C, and cocaine. Chucking in my boomer mobile. I'm chucking. Spending my college kids' tuition, I'm trucking. With my 401k, I'm trucking. Living on pills, vitamin C, and cocaine. Trucking. Got my chips cashed in at the Boomer Casino. <laughs> and my 401k, I'm trucking. One toke over the line. <laughs> One Boomer toke over the line. Anyway. I could go on forever with, I, I can't stand the, who likes the Grateful Dead? I don't, man, I've never liked that stuff. Although I will say when I had my bad trip that one time, there was one Grateful Dead song that made me feel a little better. It, it, it did ease me, but I guess that's what it's there for, right? It's supposed to, it was supposed to ease you, man. <laughs> oh, calm down, man. You have a bad trip, dude. Oh, chill, man. Trucking. Got my casino chips cashed in. Keep trucking. Like the pee pee poo poo man. Keep trucking. Like the Crowley man. Living on pills, vitamin C, and cocaine. <laughs> Living on pills, vitamin C, and cocaine. Trucking. <laughs> casino chips cashed in. Keep trucking. Pee pee poo poo man. Keep trucking. I'm, I'm sensing something that coming out of this. Right? They could, you could do a boomer dead song. Uh, there's, there's something here. Something in that. Last time, I remember on that one stream, I had to take down because it was great, too. There was like thousands of views right away when I was doing karaoke night. Remember that? And I was singing, Boomers in the pool. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. <laughs> Take take a long holiday. Do 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 do. Let the children play. Ding 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 ding. Do. Like a boomer in the pool with a noodle too. <laughs> Boomers in the pool. Do 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 do. Anyway, well, let's move on to midsummer. Midsummer. Chucking. Got my chips cashed in. Keep trucking. I hate that song. That shit is so stupid, man. I can't believe any. Why does anybody like that stuff? Why do y'all goofballs like that stuff? All right, so that's my analysis of Wicker Man. And as you can see, all of the principles are there. All the pagan stuff is there. The rights. Thank you guys so much for all these generous super chats. I'll read some of those here in a minute. Catch everybody. Catch everybody up. Midsommar. So Midsommar stars the Swedish chef. <laughs> the Swedish meatball chef. This movie was gruesome, dude. I was like, whoa. Trying to find you can't find the movie posters anymore. There we go. Me it's some other. If you like this kind of analysis, get signed copies of Esther Hollywood. So let's talk about Midsummer. So I know if you haven't seen it, uh, I mean there will be spoilers here. Warning. Would I recommend this movie? Mm, I don't know. It's kind of gruesome.
mainly, it's not scary, first of all. This movie's not scary. Will it trigger you? Mm. Will it trigger a bad trip, man? Yeah, probably. Uh, but we need to talk about it. So this chick, modern America, breaks up with her boyfriend, or they're in the process of breaking up. He doesn't know what he wants to do. Uh, we see an image kind of reminiscent of Hollywood Babylon, which is interesting because there's this play on modernity and civilization set over against the idyllic, we think, world of the savage, pagan, the, the noble savage, we think. Of course, everybody who saw this trailer knew that it wasn't going to be Noble Savages. We knew it was a cult thing, obviously, right? From, but right away, I thought, this is, is this just Wicker Man? Uh, yeah, pretty much. With some new twists, uh, good cinematography, interesting takes on things. If you want, if you want to know what a bad trip is like, uh, her bad trip is like a bad trip. Um, but she's breaking up with her boyfriend. We see this image in this bar with the dudes all hanging out. And it kind of looks like Hollywood Babylon. I couldn't really tell what the picture was, but... Um, I don't think it was Jane Mansfield, but it kind of looked like the Hollywood Babylon cover. So I was thinking, all right, is this supposed to, you know, just contrast the two, juxtaposition of the two cultures, maybe. And we see um, a lot of moon imagery. All right, so moon stuff. We know that her sister is in a, a bipolar depression state, and she decides to commit suicide. So the main chick, I forget her name. Anyway, she's gone through trauma. Immediate. Danny goes through trauma. She's been, she's been traumatized. Uh, and her bipolar sister has not just committed suicide, but also piped CO2 from, not CO2, uh, carbon monoxide from the car, from the garage, <coughs> excuse me, into the house. Boomer Garcia, man. <laughs> Boomer, Boomer Jerry, man. Jerry lives, man. <laughs> I'm glad you guys like that character. The, the audience is enjoying this. The Boomer, Boomer Deadhead guy. You know what I want to do? I'll do a series, like a comedic thing. <laughs> Remember Tracy Ullman? She's not that funny. But she would play all these characters, which... I'll give her props for being a bunch of different characters. But if I was to do like a comedic show type of thing, I would be all these different characters like Tracy Ullman. That's a good idea. I could do the boomer guy. Boomer deadhead guy. He'd be a good character. Anyway. i got to find the right comic people to work with. I can't do that all on my own. i got to have another... got to have a, a troop to work with. But nobody ever wants to work together and do stuff. can't find a troop. Anyway, I'm trying to figure out my notes. Okay, so by the way, did you notice there's a lot of imagery that, pre that prepped for that? There was a picture that she had over her bed when she's crying after her family dies of Goldilocks and the bear. She's Goldilocks, obviously, right? And I knew right away, oh, this, is, this is foreshadowing the moon, prepping us for what's to come. It's ominous. This is... Uh, it's all snowy, right? Death in literature, snow, death, the moon. These are all foreshadowing of ominous things to come. Typical literary analysis. <clears throat> so she's invited to, uh, reluctantly, with this troop of dudes from grad school who are going to study one of the guys' commune in Sweden. Sweden? Swedish, right? Yeah. And it's a small commune. <clears throat> I can't read my notes. I was trying to write in the movies. And it's hard to read your notes when you're writing in the dark. Um, there was a book, by the way, that most people didn't. I know. I, I heard a few analyses from some people on this. I think Isaac did an analysis, Illuminati Watcher. Um, and he, did, he, he had the right idea. But a lot of people didn't notice the book on the table where all the grad guys are chilling. Uh, it was a book called The Nazi, The Secret Nazi Language of the Utmark. Utmark. The Secret Nazi Language of the Utmark. 
Uh, and I forgot to look that up. Is that real? I don't even know. Let's see if that's a real thing. It looked like a real book. But this was another clue. See, if you're watching movies, you want to, Jay, how do I watch movies as you do? Pay attention to the details. That's how. Because most of the time, books in the background behind people, and that, that's, it's telling you what's going to happen. Let's see if that's a real book. The Sinkwit Room. Let's see what image of. Of Uthmark. Ooh, Uthark, excuse me. It is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is why they were, and other people apparently, because the movie's coming up. The director of Hereditary talked about this. Uh, and so here is this book. No, that's not it. Maybe it's not a real book. <laughs> well, there are books apparently very similar to this, but I don't see a book with specifically that title, so maybe he made that up. Uh, and, of course, we know the, the director is, of course, the director who did Hereditary, which was based around Key of Solomon, Ritual Magic. Uh, really dark, really, really dark movie. Um, was it creepy? It was genuinely creepy it had some creepy stuff uh that yucky last scene uh, more so yucked me out i don't i don't uh, i wouldn't say it scared me uh, there was nothing that scared me <laughs> hereditary is just gross and that poor ugly kid losing her head double whammy ugly as heck kid <laughs> and she loses her head double whammy um but that was all about like sigils and, and, and trying to get the re-impregnation or the, the, the incarnation of the deity. Uh, what was the deity? Paimon, you know, this thing from Key of Solomon. Anyway, so that's the director of Midsommar, right? And we have the same stuff with Wicker Man. Obviously, this guy was like really influenced by Wicker Man. Uh, no doubt about that. And so when they go to this place out in the middle of nowhere, right away, which is interesting because it made me think of the MK Ultra stuff, she's uh, invited to trip uh, shrooms. I can't remember if they had any other. Well, they had a bunch of different hallucinogenic things throughout the film. So this whole ritual weekend, right? And this is something I've talked about with these religions often utilizing hallucinogens. Now, the reason that's relevant is because when the CIA studied all this stuff, they studied the indigenous cultures to understand how these cultures control people, uh, particularly like the shaman class, the priest class. Right? How were they doing this? Well, they were ritually initiating people with intense hallucinogens. That's from Wicker Man, by the way. There's all your, uh, there's Benji, if you've seen Benji the Hunted. <laughs> Look at that goofy looking dog mask. Uh, and then there's Star Fox, and then there's some ugly chick. But that's the, the mask I was talking about. Anyway, <laughs> same stuff here. Totally just like Wicker Man. Uh, it turns out it's a cult. It's a commune. The funny thing about this movie, every possible red flag for this whole crew of grad students, were these the dumbest grad students on the face of the planet? That they are studying this culture and they literally have icon iconography all over every building, in including giant drapes, giant quilts, of menstrual fluid and pubes being baked into cakes, people getting their heads smushed with mallets, people being burnt up, bears being... I mean, literally everything in the movie is in all of the artwork on the wall. And they're all like, what is with all this artwork? It's so crazy. And then they're literally seeing each one of the aspects of this festival over the period in all the artwork playing out before them and all of these dumb grad students can't figure out that they're the sacrifice. That was the thing that kind of bugged me. It was like, I mean, come on, nobody would be a grad student 
this dumb. Except for, I guess, all these people. And this is out in the middle of, what do they call it, housing land. Uh, supposed to be hou housing land, Sweden. And who's the main guy? The um, guy that looks just like Chris Pratt mixed with Seth Rogen. Chris Rogan, Seth Pratt. We'll call him Seth Pratt. Seth Pratt is Christian. That's his name. Obviously, that's symbolic. He's the exact same as the cop in Wicker Man. And then these other guys who have Bible names. Joshua, Mark. I don't remember the black dude's name. He might have been Mark. I can't remember. Um, so, Christian, Joshua, Mark, blah, blah, blah. And everybody in the cult, they've got crazy Swedish pagan names, right? So another reason, another thing that people didn't catch was that there's a specific statement about because it's 9 p.m. and the sky in this in this region during the season is always blue. It's like a you know a long, long, long like a like a 24 hour period of sunset or, or where the sun's up, Alaska type stuff. There's a statement where we're told that this is what we call the midnight sun. Midnight, black, sun, black, sun, the black sun. And that's not the only reference to the black sun, because there's another black character who makes his presence during the crazy dance scene. By the way, I'm not going to recommend this movie because of the yucky sex scene. It's not a yucky sex scene that will turn you on. Even if you're a creepo. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, it's not animals, but... Yeah. It's a movie where you look away. I'll put it that way. So, by the way, so she has been traumatized, the main girl... This is part the, the whole movie is her initiation. That's the whole point of this. And my theory is that the Swedish dude from the cult, he organized this to bring her there because he wanted her. And he wanted her through the ritual working. His offering is these nine people who are offered. Uh, he, he, part of that is his offering. Right? And so what does he get out of this bargain? He gets his May Queen, who is the chick, Danny. So she actually goes through the ritual psychodrama processing of initiation, and it works. And the initiation begins with the intense hallucinogens, and she sees her dead sister. She has the bad trip. Everything's all wavy. And she sees her feet as growing, like, she has hobbit feet, but they're growing grass out of her. She's growing grass out of her feet. She's nature. She's mother nature. She's Achieving this union with nature. But isn't it interesting that in all these religions, the union with nature requires human sacrifice. I wonder why that is. Maybe it's because the spirits of nature are demons and they hate humans. And they incite every culture in the world to practice human sacrifice. But that would mean that Moses and the Ten Commandments were correct, wouldn't it? That would mean that Romans 1 is correct, because that's what Romans 1 says. Anyway, the black sun, the worship of Lucifer and the demand for human sacrifice is the root of this film. Evident right away, anybody who was a basic bitch in symbolism would know this. It was all right there. So Danny passes out. She loses track of time. She's in the process of initiation. Um, she is initiated. It's a nine-day fast. Nine tables, the nine. Nine is a number of initiation in many occult and esoteric traditions. It's also every 90 years that they have this festival. The other thing I noticed is that this cult, which is, I think, somewhat based on the indigenous practices of ancient Swedish folk traditions. It also has a very Crowleyan element to it. Did you notice that? A giant pyramid temple? 
Did they really use pyramids? I, it was very possible that they could have used pyramids in Swedish folk traditions. Pyramids seem to be unanimous across the pagan traditions. Have you noticed, have you seen about these pyramids in like Eastern Europe? Pyramids in like, I think Serbia or somewhere? Croatia, there's giant pyramids like Egypt. The ziggurats down in Latin and South America, they're pyramids. So there's something about pyramids, right? Seems to signify that kind of a worship. Uh, Goldilocks comes up again. She's Goldilocks. Her boyfriend is the bear because he represents the passions. He represents the fool in a way. Now, he's not the, the fool. The, 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 the guy who has the bad thing happen to his wee-wee is actually the fool, but the Christian character is also kind of a fool because he's being led down the path, and he is controlled by his passions. Um, that's what he represents. He's burned up. Uh, and then the fool guy is also has control by his passions because he pees on the, the sacred tree. <laughs> That's what uh, gets him in trouble, if you remember that scene. And you stay in this nursery until you're 36? Uh, that's, that's pretty weird. That's weird there. But again, no one in this crew of millennial grad students has any discernment to figure out that this is a messed up situation I'd be booking it right away bro so as we see from the very beginning and the initial offering the two old people once they reach age 72 it's their duty to uh, practice euthanasia and they give themselves back to mother earth and if you remember they walk off the giant cliff and that's what initially traumatizes everybody all the grad students that have gone and they're freaked out. Now, this reminded me of the scene in Conan where James Earl Jones does the exact same thing in his snake cult where he tells, and this is ironic because he looks over at Conan and he says, he says, let me show you my power. And he says, come to me, come to me, my child, come to me, my child. And the girl uh, walks off the cliff and just right, offers herself to uh, the snake god. Exact same thing here. Exact same thing. Why? Because the snake is the Ouroboros, is the sun, is the cyclical circle cycle. This circle that you see right here around the maple, that circle, is the never ending cyclical pattern of nature, the snake from Plato's Timaeus. That's what it is. Uh, they don't bury bodies there. They cremate them. No shocker there. Right? Cremation is the pagan Masonic rite that promotes Gnosticism. Why do we bury the dead in the biblical tradition? Because of the resurrection. That's why. When you cremate, you are putting up your middle finger to the doctrine of the resurrection. Literally. Literally. That's why we don't cremate. And I've also always kind of thought to myself, this is just my own speculation, why cremate? Why are you throwing the dead into giant blazes of fire? Is that suggesting, like, hell, perhaps? By the way, in the Orthodox view, hell is the actual presence of God itself. That's what hell is. And if you are wicked, you're going to experience that as not a good thing you don't get away from god like god's not there and you're in some place where there god there's a god vacuum and you're in dante's pit god is everywhere so what torments the wicked is the same thing that blesses the righteous <clears throat> it is the face of god that's the orthodox view uh let's see so we talked about uh now she's she is surviving this because she's already traumatized, which is interesting. So the other people in this cult, these other grad students, they can't handle it. Uh, they're all traumatized. They end up being, it's a kind of a survival of the fittest thing going on here. And spoiler alert, she's the only one that survives. Nobody makes it through this but her. That was, I think, the plan all along. I mean, that's kind of what the Swedish 
guy who organized the whole thing wanted because he wanted to be with her. He had a crush on her. Uh, she sees the black something. S snork? There's no snorks in this. But I can't read my notes. So there's something about... Another something comes up. The black... Uh, when she's at the dance scene, there's another statement about, oh, when he comes, he will, ch the black one comes and he will choose uh, the May Queen. The black one comes and he'll choose the May Queen. There's a, by the way, there's a reference to Pan. That was another Crowleyan element there that I wanted to mention. Bloodlines are key here because of ancestor worship, obviously. Um, it's a, it's a, Evolution fits into this because evolution is just a representation of all the ancient pagan religions because nature is just this never-ending evolutionary process, supposedly. Now, let's see. I had some more. Let's see. Mid. Mid summer. Uh, green man. Midsummer murders the green man. No, that's some boomer TV show. That's not what we want. What is this bit boomer nonsense? Midsummer. Um, people often ask, what is a bad trip like? It's like this movie. <laughs> uh, pretty creepy stuff going on in some of this. Yeah, so there you go. You see that? That's the end when they're going to burn everybody up in the, uh, the giant gold pyramid the giant luciferian pyramid here as you see so i was going to see if there's any uh, further relevant imagery i don't think these are that here's a flying boomer for you We were sacrifice launched. <laughs> uh, if you see, if you're anywhere and you see boomers flying through the air off of cliffs, leave because you are in a bad place. Um, oh, inbreeding. Inbreeding is a part of this. I'm not going to say much more than that. We don't get too gross on this stream. Did you notice the similarity between these sigils and what you see in folk voodoo stuff? That looks like voodoo stuff. It also kind of looks like square and, or the, the square and compass Masonic stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. When you go to Marie Laveau's tomb, you see the XXX on it. Because that's supposed to, do, you do the little XXX when the ritual, when what you asked for was was done. Um, so anyway, she's, she goes through this process. Uh, she wins the dance competition because I guess the black one has energized her. Uh, the black one survived, yeah, it's called the black one. And thus she survives the dance, everybody else passes out. Um, there's a statement about everything being Maya, illusion, classic Indo-Vedic paganism. Astrology comes into this. It's the time of the 90-year cycle when human sacrifice has to be offered. Um, there's an itch. Did you notice she gets the gift of tongues? That was crazy. Where uh, when she's dancing around in this whirling dervish, she gets so... By the way, they're doing hallucinogens in that scene. And then she starts to... She mystically knows the language. So she's been processed, uh, and she gets the inverted gift of tongues. So there's an inversion of a lot of like the, the Christian Pentecost uh, theology here. <clears throat> uh, they have the big May Queen festival. They, she eats the body cake. She's part of the family now. So she lost her family. She's now in this new family cult. Nine lives given, nine lives sacrificed was key that's who's burnt up in the, the big uh, pyramid <clears throat> the christian was trapped by his lust 
and was burned up. He is the dumb douchebag. And then the, the three faceless characters. I think they're supposed to be the three faceless fates, I think. Uh, they represent the fates because, of course, all uh, pagan religion is based around chaos, ultimately fate, the three fates. Uh, but I, I'm guessing, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure in Nordic mythology who the three, these faceless, they look like faceless shriners or something. That part's kind of creepy, but... Oh, and then they say, the beast, we banish thee. The beast being the Christian. So they view the Christian as the beast, whom they banish through the right of the giant burning pyramid. So then uh, it ends up being, again, another presentation of basically Wicker Man. Exact same plot. Um, let see if I had any more notes. And really, who is behind this religion? The black one, the midnight sun, Lucifer. Lucifer is the black burning midnight sun. Black midnight oil. How do we scream when the world's on fire? How do, when, our, when our beds are burning. <laughs> I mean, they, they used to play that song. That song's really annoying. All right, I'm going to read a few Super Chats, and then we'll do um, a Stranger's Thing. <laughs> Get it? Get it? Stranger's Thing? Up to 300, wow. Wow, guys, thank you for all these. You guys are being super generous. Much appreciated. <clears throat> a Stranger's Thing. <laughs> Get it? I wasn't sure how I wanted to do the analysis of Stranger's Things, so Stranger's Stranger at Things. So I just kind of decided to throw it into this. And by the way, I think I will do. There was enough in Midsommar to do a video as well as Wicker Man and compare the two. So there'll be a fancy 15 to 20 minute video this week on that. <clears throat> but let's talk about. Uh, E.T., I mean, uh, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, uh, I mean, Red Dawn, uh, I mean, uh, everything from the 80s, I mean, uh, Stranger Things 3. So, um, there was aspects of Season 3 I appreciated. Uh, if you want my full analysis of Stranger Things, you can get signed copies of Esoter... Or, or Eso How do I do that? I can't... Stranger Things, in here which you can purchase signed copies at Jay's Analysis in the shop. <clears throat> um, but did you notice that uh, basically all guys are goofballs and goofuses and idiots and Russians are evil. That was a, a big part <laughs> of season three. So, uh, right at the beginning, the kid with no uh, upper teeth, uh, the kid who has the curly hair and only bottom teeth, he builds an antenna after he gets back from Camp No More, no, Camp Nowhere, N-O-W, where. Uh, that is E.T. building the antenna to speak to people. Um, and... He intercepts the Russian transmission. Spoiler alert if you've not seen Stranger Things Season 3. I did want to touch on one crazy thing in the news. Which relates to Tennessee. 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 Take me to another place. And this is the old Oak Ridge facility. Scientists seeking to open a portal at Oak Ridge. Now, I think this is a bunch of hooey, news nonsense stuff. Here's the image they chose. <laughs> like opening a portal to what? Wine Mom Village? Out in at the far reaches of space, there's a wine mom, a wine ant out there. That's all there is. That's all the portals do. <clears throat> But it was weird that Stranger Things is out this right now. And this was the big news story. 
that was going around. I'll show you. Here it is. Come on. That's their picture. <laughs> that picture looks ridiculous. So here's the news story. We'll read some of this. Oh, yeah. Right. Scientists are searching for a mirror universe. It could be sitting right in front of you. The mirror verse. Uh oh, the upside down. And it, it exists in upcoming experiments involving subatomic particles. Yeah, have you noticed the uh, propaganda around subatomic particles? Basically, they just tack anything onto quantum physics, quantum foam, subatomic particles. And basically, it means anything. A lot of this is nonsense. I'm sorry. But in Oak Ridge facility in Tennessee, that's where they built the bomb. Manhattan Project. Leah Broussard is trying to open a portal to a parallel universe. She calls it an oscillator, an oscillation that would lead to the mirror matter. Uh, but the idea is fundamentally the same. In a series of experiments she runs at, she plans to run. Oh, wait, so it hasn't even been done yet. They will send a beam of subatomic particles down a 50-foot tunnel. This is what's in Stranger Things. I'm not saying this is real. I'm saying that this is in Stranger Things. They have that big accelerator CERN thing in season three. Spoiler alert. And it is opening up the portal to the upside down. And it has let the mind flare in. Oh, and then here we have Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Here we have John Carpenter's The Thing. Every, every 80s monster packed into one movie. Red Dawn is even Red Dawn, the movie is mentioned. So the CERN cyclotron particle accelerator that the Russians are using in an underground base under a mall in America. Russians have an, an underground base and facilities in America where they're using a particle accelerator. Okay, come on. Come on. Uh, I mean, yeah. So dumb. So obvious propaganda. But you do see in this uh, cycle, uh, the, the, the thing poster. Remember when the mall rats were popping? Y'all, them mall rats is popping. What's popping? What's popping? Uh, mall rats are popping. The, the rats pop, literally, because of Mandela effect, CERN type stuff going on. And this opens the reopens the hole to the upside down, and then we get the Cthulhu alien face sucker mind flare coming back through. Who possessed uh, Will in season two? As a result of all these electromagnetic disturbances, field disturbances, magnets no longer work, and thankfully Winona Ryder screams through the entire season helping us understand that magnets no longer work. Uh, Winona Ryder has three, uh, two emotions in Stranger Things. Uh, silent concern and whisper and freak out yell. Her two, her range of acting in Stranger Things. I'm just kidding, I'm making jokes. Uh, if Winona Ryder is a Dave Nelson's fan, it's just jokes, it's just jokes. But magnets don't work and she will scream to let you know that. So the mall, uh, which there is an interesting kind of commentary on capitalism versus Sovietism and globalism, because the mall represents capitalism, and underneath this are these Soviets. So there's the the eighties commie social, you know, uh, uh, capitalist dialectic going on, and there is kind of a hint that it's a dialectic. Interestingly, that aspect of it was 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 interesting. However. We're also presented with the idea that Hop and his toxic masculinity perhaps need to be left in the 80s. That's kind of what I came away with. Maybe, maybe I'm a little off with that interpretation. I, I don't know. But it seemed like the way it ended in this season, spoiler alert, um, was kind of saying that. Like, hey, we appreciate, you know, Indiana Jones and all that. We appreciate Snake Plissken, Jack Burton. I was born ready. On a dark and stormy night, some guys got you up against the wall. And he says, hey, Jack, have you paid your dues? You tell him what old Jack Burton says. Yeah, I paid my dues. Checks in the mail. 
I think my Jack Burns pretty good. It's all right. Snake Plissken just kind of does that raspy whisper, so you can't really do a Snake Plissken. But anyway, there was a you know this, the the Hop character is basically Indiana Jones, Han Solo, Snake Plissken, blah blah blah, and the end seems to be, you know, uh, you belong in the 80s go back to the 80s we had fun with you toxic male uh but stay in the 80s and hence hop is sacrificed and it takes place july 4th which is 1776 now this is interesting because 1776 is another arm of the revolutionary tradition 1789 right france the jacobins the Girondins. we've i've talked about this many many times jason and Elsa's. And Americanism, born of 1776, is just another version of the revolutionary ethos, the revolutionary faith. Fire in the minds of men, James Billington. The revolutionary faith gave birth to a left wing and a right wing, the Jacobins and the Girondins. And America and Americanism represents the right wing of the revolution. So it's taking place during July 4th and Independence Day as the continuation of that revolutionary theme because... Moving out of the 80s and into today is another phase of revolution. We're continuing the revolution. And what has to be left in the past, because revolution, you see, is a never-ending process. It never ends. It just keeps going on. Because to the revolutionary, the true faith that they have is faith in flux, faith in change, faith in process, faith in evolution. That's all it is. Change, 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 change. Moving beyond dialectics to the next, to the next, to the next. Caught in dialectics, ironically, as they think they're moving past dialectics. Now, this will be especially relevant uh, in the next day or two when I do part one of Fritoff Capra and Turning Point. Because that's what Turning Point is about. Everything I told you, that's in Turning Point. I knew exactly where he was going to go. I was totally on. And it's perfect for Jay's analysis. You're going to see how the manipulation of dialectics in Turning Point is completely applicable to everything that we've been talking about in the Globalism book series, as well as theological dialectics, too. So anyway, we get uh, a lot of statements about materialism. Material, I, I am a material girl. Uh, so L gets to experience that side of things, right? She goes to this growing. There, there's the coming of age aspect to L, right? And I'm going to save the rest of my Stranger Things season three analysis for the future because there will be another aspect. This is not going to be a part two for subscribers, probably uh, just material that I'll put into a video. But we've been going for a while, so I'm going to go ahead and do the Super Chats. Uh, and I'll cover more of Stranger Things Season 3 in a video. And then I'll do a fancy video with Wicker Man and Midsommar compared. <clears throat> but we've been going almost two hours. I only wanted to do about two hours for this. Come to me, my child. Come to me. Come to me, my child. Clam! And by the way, the funny thing about that, I forgot to mention, Arnold in Conan, he worships Crom. Right? They're like, who do you worship? I worship Krom. That's literally how he says it. Krom. And Krom was an ancient pagan god who required human sacrifice. <laughs> so Arnold is fighting the snake god who requires human sacrifice. But Arnold serves Krom who requires human sacrifice. And did you know that Oliver Stone, the great Oliver Stone, wrote Conan? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, Conan is interesting. We need to do an uh, analysis of Conan. I just keep forgetting I don't, I don't get around to it. But eventually we will. We'll get to Conan. Crime! Who do you worship? Crime! Next time somebody asks me where, to go, where I go to church, I'm going to say, Crime! <laughs> Yo, bro, where do you go to church? Crime! I serve crime. All right. Super chat time. <clears throat> I 
I did see Chucky too, by the way. Uh, Chucky had an interesting anti-tech message, which I didn't expect in Chucky. That was weird. I'm not sure what to make of it, but his face looked funny. Did you see Chucky's face? If you, if you saw Chucky, you'll laugh at that. You'll know what I'm doing. Um, crime! Robert199. Chucky lost his cheese. Help him find it. Oh, you're talking about Chucky e. Cheese. I thought you were talking about Chucky. Chucky was weird. John Gross, $5. Did you ever see Invitation to Hell? It's a Wes Craven TV movie with Robert Urich and the snake broad from Blade Runner. It's pretty woke for the 80s. I have not. Uh, I may have to write that down somewhere. I don't have a pen. Invitation to Hell, Wes Craven. Thank you, John Gorris. We'll check that out. Maybe that'd be worth an analysis. Justin Stam, 2012, 10 bucks. You survived the deluge, barely. Thank you. The spirit of Nick Cage was there. Port of call. My bad lieutenant dove into the waters and saved me. I'm joking. I'm just joking. Thank God. Not Nick Cage. Thank God. Uh, do you think the reptile aliens known as the brothers did this to assassinate? Yes, it was a voodoo ritual. Uh, all of my haters got together in a secret underground base underneath the Starcourt Mall and summoned through CERN Harp technology a massive freak storm called Hurricane Katrinka Part Deuce. Pardieu, Pardieu, because it's France, New Orleans, right? To assassinate me and it didn't work. Thank you for your work. Hilarious KJ impersonation. Private death, fight off. Yes, thank you guys. By the way, I'm not hating on KJ. You know we love KJ. KJ uh, came on Boiler Room. Uh, hopefully KJ will be back on Boiler Room, but get down, chubs. Get down, chubs. Down. Hey, guys, KJ here. Get down, chubs. All in good fun. We love KJ. Hunter Vex, $2. Facebook is only for <clears throat> and the media. Prove me wrong. Facebook is boomer tech. Boomer level. But thank you, Hunter Vex. Hedda Geber, $20. Thank you, Hedda. That is a midsummer sounding name. Please do not feed me hallucinogens and make me dance around the maypole and burn me up in a giant pyramid. But thank you. Hey, the Gebert. Alexander199. Debate Mark Brahman on, or STJ. Don't know who STJ is, but sure, I would debate Mark Brahman. I don't know who STJ is, though. Robert499. How is it that Ulets and Kuta are rising to the French Canadian surface of science? I don't, I don't know what that is. Is that sounds like food? It sounds like something that you would order in New Orleans. Yeah, can I get an oodlet and a cute? Sounds like something that Nick Cage would be very proud of ordering. And by the way, have you seen the clip where he says, "Well, I call my acting technique neo shamanic. It's neo shamanic." Told you, Lieutenant. CHF two what are I don't know what two CHFs are but why is the Nicola why this Nicholas impersonator say I'm bad why this Nicholas Cage impersonator say I'm bad oh bad lieutenant bad lieutenant is the movie but thank you lieutenant skeleton five bucks you should have joined us last night for anime night. In your server, I'm taking. I'm thinking that's a joke because I think uh, anime is banned on the Jay's analysis Discord. <laughs> so I think Skeleton is making a joke, but uh, I am not the mod of my own server. We were watching and dubbing for NGE English dubbing for NGE. On oh, so you guys are making jokes? Okay, I don't know. I don't know what NGE uh, Neo Neon Genesis Evangelion. That's the one thing that we will allow. We're going to do an analysis of that. Okay. But uh, that does sound funny. Alexander199, did the West ever not believe in ADS? It doesn't become a, a very ensconced 
idea until after the, the, the rise of the preeminence of Augustine. Um, so we wouldn't say that Augustine himself was necessarily bad-willed in that. Um, he did not intentionally, I don't think, want those kinds of uh, theologumina, his theological opinions, to rise to the level of, of dogma, but unfortunately in the West they did because he became such a towering figure in the West and he, he kind of becomes the dominant uh, ideological disseminator for the West after his time and into um, the early medieval period. And then, of course, Aquinas sort of takes up that model, and so you get the three A's. You get Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas pretty much being the dominant theological tradition in the West. Now, there are other traditions that are there. Scotism, Bonaventure, I know about all that. I knew about all this 10 years ago. I read all that stuff when I thought maybe the Uniates have an answer. But I was not convinced of Uniatism precisely because of the fact that the attitude and the mindset of the East, where all the councils happened, was different from this. They did not follow the mindset of a single dude, whether it's a single theologian, the character of St. Augustine, or whether it's a single guy and the figure of the Pope. It was a synodal approach. It was a ecumenical approach, and hence councils. So you can't just say, well, uh, if Augustine was acceptable at s some period or if he gained preeminence in some area or some region or some uh, west western side of the globe or whatever, it doesn't matter because in the process of Orthodox theology forming in terms of not evolving, but forming in terms of its statements as to what the truth is, later developments correct earlier views. So once the two churches evolved down two different paths, and that's why in the East we have synods that are called the, quote, Palamite synods. They're just Orthodox synods that reaffirm what we've always said. And after those synods, such as Black Herne and so forth, you cannot hold to those ideas that we might have tolerated at a certain time period. So in other words, um, somebody could be wrong about something in the second century and be a church father, because we don't judge them on the basis ex post facto unless they said something really heretical, like Origen, right? Origen is not a saint, and he's just a patristic writer. And Origen's errors were so significant that the church eventually anathematized him at the Fifth and Sixth Councils. Now, Augustine is still considered a father in the Fifth, in the fifth Council. He's listed amongst the patristic florigelium. But we don't ascribe to him the preeminence that he has in the West because in the East, where all the councils were held, he has pretty much hardly anything to do with Christology at all. And the triad and Christology are all formulations, 90% of which come out of the East. There are important Western, Western figures. I don't, I don't mean to undermine uh, St. Hippolytus, uh, Hilary of Poitiers, right? these various church fathers that do write in the West on the Trinity in ways that we would perfectly accept. But what happens is that later theology specifies the difference between hypostatic origin and eternal manifestation. This is specified at Black Rene, which is an Orthodox synod that's binding for us as Orthodox. You can't reject Black Rene and accept Uniatism and be Orthodox. You can leave Orthodoxy if you want to, but you can't be Orthodox and accept the Synod of Black Rene because it makes the important distinction between hypostatic origin, eternal energetic manifestation, and the economic sending of the Spirit. That whole council is about that. So another example of this would be sometimes when people are new to this topic, they'll say, oh, uh, St. Maximus the Confessor has a letter to Marinus where he says, that the Westerns don't intend to be in error on the filioque. Correct. And that's why we don't anathematize all the Westerns at that time period. However, there were post-Maximus era developments that did lead to the clarification wherein the Westerns did violate the sole monarchia of the Father. Namely, after the time of St. Photius and the Mystagogy, and when it becomes clear after the there's two councils, there's two Eighth Councils. There's an Eastern Eighth Council and a Western Eighth Council. The Pope signed the Eastern Eighth Council, by the way. It's admitted, well known. Deal with that one as you will, Roman Catholics. Good luck with that. But regardless, after that Eighth Council period, you have the 
successive debates on the nature of the Godhead, on the role of the Son in the Spirit. And the two churches clearly take two different paths. Just read Black Renee. I just bought a book. Where is my book I just bought that deals with this? I'll show you. People coming into my Discord don't even know about this. Heresy hunting in the Discord, and they don't even know what energetic manifestation means. They don't even know how crucial this is. Okay, good book here. Crisis in Byzantium. Papadakis. Cool Greek name, bro. Papadakis. And what do we have in this book? Why? It's a whole chapter from Black Rene. On what? What's this whole chapter in Black Rene on? Can you see that? The Tomos eternal manifestation. Bro, I've been here telling you this. I've been here talking about all this. I know what I'm talking about. Go get the book. I'm not making up stuff. Anyway. So did the West ever not believe in ADS? Yes, because it's a idea that kind of evolves over time and eventually becomes problematic, specifically when councils and Eastern uh, dogmatic theology specifies it. That's why there's a gigantic debate. And by the way, I'm so glad that this is now easily uh, available in print. This will shut the mouths of all ecumenists. Anybody who tries to reconcile Aquinas with Palamas, I have the documents. I have the documents. I literally do have the documents. I literally have the documents right here. Guess what? I've got good news. This is no longer $200 on Amazon. The debate between the Orthodox and the Barleyamite, which crushes, crushes all the lying ecumenists who said that we teach the same thing as Thomism, because the whole debate is against a guy who believes in absolute divine simplicity. Nobody with an IQ over 90, well, if your IQ is around 90, you couldn't even read this book. Nobody with an IQ over 110 who reads this book, who's not totally lying, could come away and say that we teach the same doctrine of simplicity as the Thomists. Read the book, dumb dumb. And by the way, it's not $200 anymore. I've got good news for you. The debate between Palamas and Barleon is now $20. $20. Where? SNUY Press has picked this up. It used to be some Brigham Young or something crazy. Now it's SNUY Press. Go to SNUY Press's page, order the book, and shut up. This is the week of vindication, my friends. The week of vindication. By the way, also a good book. A study in Palamas. Mind Lord. Can you feel the love tonight? Can you see one more time? Eternal manifestation in Papadakis. I know what I'm talking about. DC Customs, $5. Keep up the good work. Thank you, DC Customs. We will be keeping up the good work. Nepco, $5. Jay Boomer's up here in Boston. Got a casino built. Got a casino. Got a casino. Sweet cherry red. Ha ha. Steve Brule. Can you believe that? Uh, of course I can. Shaking my damn head at the Boomers. Well, anywhere you see crescinos uh, is a boomer land. But um, I guess all that sweet, sweet, sweet mafia cash can go straight to the mafia. And the boomers are like, it's going to bring jobs and education. <laughs> anyway, 10 bucks, new character, Boomer Garcia. I like it. Yeah, yeah, man, I, I like that idea too, man. <laughs> Jerry, man. Jerry was a hero, man. Jerry lives. <laughs> Uh, 
But thank you, DC Customs. Much appreciated. Scott Morse, $8. I wish I had more to give. Stay weird, Captain Dar. Always weird. Always weird. Stay weird. You got an Illuminati shirt? You got like an owl and you're a Bohemian Grove shirt. But thank you, Scott Morse. Much appreciated. We will stay weird. Captain Dyer signing off. Don Don. Don Juan. Don Don. 45. <laughs> that is Super Chat of the Night right there. How do I get... Now I lost it. Where'd it go? How do I get to the transcendent argument when debating an evolutionary atheist? He admits that our worldview has an effect on how we interpret the evidence, but I'm not sure how to pull it together. Um, I, that's why I did that really lengthy stream trying to uh, really lay this out. So the best thing for you would be to watch this stream and take notes. It's the one with me in the Bayes' Boomer outfit. Everybody's like, what do you mean? What does that mean? Boomer jokes, dude. I am the father of boomer jokes. Literally. I came up with this whole trend. Nobody's giving me credit, though. But we started that joke. Essays I wrote 10 years ago making fun of boomers. So if you watch that stream, I'm trying to find it. What did I call it? It's called Transcendental. Here it is. That's the, the show image if you're looking for it. You'll see that. That's the right one. And then here's me looking like a moron, drinking coffee. So if you follow through this chat, bruh, hopefully you can kind of see the, the process of where I was taking the argument. Because there's a lot of, actually, there's a lot of different transcendental arguments. There's not just one, right? So this, this video is the one you want to watch if you haven't watched it. God's existence and transcendental arguments. And the, the cover image is me wearing this goofy base boomer thing. That's the one you want to watch. And I try to take you through that process of the argument as a whole. There's also an older talk that I did called Eastern Theology and Transcendental Arguments. And there's also the talk that I did on numbers and transcendental arguments, you see. So there's a lot of different transcendentals. Um... Sometimes the argument is spoken of as one argument because ultimately it kind of is one big argument. But there's also a lot of different types of transcendental arguments. So it really doesn't matter whether you're calling it one or many because we believe in a balance in the one and the many. They all kind of hang or fall together. But you say he is, um, you're saying you're not sure how to put it all together. Well, the easiest way to deal with the materialist atheist is to talk about things that are impossible in his worldview, things that he adheres to. So, for example, if he's a materialist, pretty much all materialists come to this goofy conclusion that numbers are social constructs. That is dumb. It is ridiculous to say that numbers are a social construct. So, so the first thing I would say is uh, read my essay, Numbers Prove God, if you've not read that. I also did a long talk called Numbers Prove God, where I try to go through this stuff. And I go through the talks that deal with, like, um, Jason Lyle's talk about uh, Mandelbrot sets, right, which show that numbers are not, there, there, there's no way a Mandelbrot set is a social construct. This is total dumb, dumb land. You have to be super low IQ, total idiot to think that a Mandelbrot set is a human social construct. There's nothing more stupid than that. This is why we don't progress in the sciences faster than we do, is because this idiot ideology is still dominant. Anyway, so you want to go through those two. And again, for people who are new to transcendental arguments, uh, the best place to start is the book by Dr. Lyle, because it's written in a very readable way, if you're not into philosophy, called Ultimate Proof by Dr. Jason Lyle. This is an introduction to transcendental argumentation written at a pretty simple level. Uh, Lyle is, is good. Lyle's a, a, a solid. I wish we could convert Dr. Lyle to orthodoxy. That'd be a good, a good thing to pray for. Uh, but he, like myself, uh, studied under Bonson. 
you can also watch the Bonson Stein debate. This is what I usually tell people if they want to learn how to debate the transcendental argument, start with the uh, Bonson Stein debate and listen to this debate about three times in a row and take notes. So you just got a big tip there because that's not all that we do in, in tutoring, obviously. We go into much more depth with tutoring, if you want to do the tutoring. But this is the place to start. We start with the Bonson-Stein debate. And you're going, you're going to be told, listen to this debate three times and take notes. And the argument will begin to gel in your head after about the third time. Now, this process of learning to do apologetics can grow to be more and more advanced. And the most advanced would be when you're ready to read books like Van Til's Apologetic, right? When you're ready to read the 700-page treatise. I read it when I was 21, all the way through. Uh, I do recommend that if you can do it. But it's very difficult if you don't have philosophy education. So you want to start with the things that I'm telling you to start with, I would say. Unless, again, Don Don, I don't know how much philosophy you do or don't know. G-Dub, 10 bucks, come to me, my child. Reminds me of Hassan, the old man of the mountain, gesturing to his assassins. Yes, exactly. Claiming that he had thousands more who were willing to do this. Boomers. <laughs> Elvis, but thank you there for that, G-Dub. Uh, Elvis Oxford, five A's. Amy Schemer has opened up a portal to find fans because no one on earth finds her funny. Maybe that's what they're doing. They're trying to find people who actually think that that's funny. Aristo Zenas, 10 bucks. Somewhat shallow and heavy handed season three. An obligatory Trump stand. You think Kerry Ilway was Trump? He, you know, he kind of, had, oh, because he works with the Russians. Even though the corrosion, the corrosion was proven. That's true. Yeah, okay. I buy that. I buy that Aristozenus. Good point. Used as a punching bag. Uh, yeah, exactly. Russians are the punching bag. Vitaly Khmelkalisky, five bucks. Thank you for that, Vitaly. Much appreciated. Warren G. Harding, two bucks. Is Tommy Wissau the greatest director of all time? Oh, hi, Warren. Oh, hi, Warren. Yeah, so hi, Warren. Yes, he is. Franz Paul, five bucks. Did Do you have David Childress impersonation? No, I don't know who that is. It would be awesome to hear David interview Nick Cage. David Childress. David Childress. Let's see who is David Childress. David Childress. David Childress accent. Oh, David Hatcher Childress? That guy? I, I don't know that I've ever heard him. I've seen his books on, you know, mystical stuff or whatever, but I, I've not heard him talk. What, let's see what he, what is, what does he sound like? Ancient aliens. Ooh. Ugly ad. All right, let's hear this guy talk. Never mind. If I play the video, it's going to like flag it. So anyway, I'll have to go listen to David Childress talk some other time. I've not heard his voice. Moral Quirks 199J debate Del, Del Bell Delphine on nihilism. Is that the bathwater chick? I'm guessing. Uh, yes, I will debate her or anyone. Uh, by the way, I'm not debating. When I say I'll debate anyone, that doesn't mean anybody with 300 subscribers. Because I was accused once again. Oh, you're you won't uh, debate so-and-so who has a thousand subs you won't debate so-and-so has 300 subs you won't debate so-and-so has 800 no i'm not debating anybody with that level of subs who always demand that i debate on their channel i'm sorry but there's 41,000 plus subs here this is where we would debate i'm not going to spend three hours debating on a channel with 300 subscribers duh why, why do you not want to debate on a channel that would give you exposure? It's goofy. Well, we know why. But Emil Zurich, $50. Thank you, Emil. Wow. What is the orthodox view of justification? Justification by theosis. That's the orthodox view. Is it based on faith alone? No. 
Faith alone is a Protestant doctrine. Even the Protestant scholar Alistair McGrath in his book, Justitia Dei, has a whole book on the fact that faith alone was nowhere present until the Reformers. Where was the church, if that's one of the pillars of the church? It's because faith alone is not true. When Abraham is spoken of and quoted in Romans, where does Paul cite? Paul does not cite Genesis 12. Paul refers to Abraham justified in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. But if the Pauline doctrine, according to the Reformers, it was true, Paul should have quoted Genesis 12. That would have been the period when he was justified, but that's not what Paul quotes. That's a problem. That was a problem for me as a reformer when I was reformed because that violates the whole argumentation of Romans. He should not be quoting Genesis 15 as the point when Abraham is justified. It's supposed to be Genesis 12, but he doesn't quote Genesis 12. It's because Abraham is continually justified, continually sanctified, continually theosified. Theified. I'm making a joke before you try to call me on that. I know theosify is not a word. It's a joke. Where do sacraments fit in? Sacra sacraments are the process of our being made holy and prepped for our uh, judgment after death, which anticipates the final judgment. So sacrifice, the sacraments are there to deify us. If not, are we then assuming that Christ didn't do it all? Well, even in the Reformed doctrine, you still have to ex exercise faith. And it doesn't matter amongst the myriad Reformed interpretations whether that means that you it's just a mental decision. I'm sorry, but that's still a noetic action. You still have to commit an action. You still have to exercise faith. And I know what Calvinism says. I know Cal I was a Calvinist for many, many years. The will has to be overridden by grace to move you to believe that's called monenergism that's monothelitism Calvinism is a monothelite heresy because it doesn't recognize that it's doctrines of grace and the overriding of the human will by grace in conversion in effectual calling leads to a Christological heresy already dealt with already condemned long ago called monenergism and monothelitism. And all these dumb, dumb reformers think that they oppose monothelitism. No, you don't. You don't know what you're talking about. In other words, do we add to Christ's sacrifice? No. But it was always understood and implied that there is the human response to the opening of the covenant. Now, that human response, you can say, is still gracious. For example, the natural energy that we have proper to our humanity was a gift of God's grace. But the human will and the natural energy proper to human will and human nature was never lost. That's where we differ from Calvinism. Calvinism thinks that you lost your will. I know they confess free will. That's not what I'm talking about. But they don't have a coherent doctrine of natural human energy of the will. That's because they don't have a coherent Christology. You cannot have proper soteriology without the right Christology. And that's why in the history of the church... The doctrines of Christology and the triad are what are, are formulated and defined first because they are the basis. They are the correct ordo theologiae for how we determine soteriology. You don't start with soteriology and all the presuppositions of the reformers and then read that into Christology. That's what leads you to the Christological heresies. That's why reformers and the reformed are Nestorian. And yes, they simultaneously hold to two heresies at once without knowing it because they're stupid. They're simultaneously monothelites and monenergists when it comes to conversion and the human will. And they're simultaneously an historian when it comes to the doctrine of penal sanctification, excuse me, uh, uh, penal sanctions, penal substitution, because they think that Christ was damned by the Father. Christ is a divine person. He's not damned by the Father. Evan Schultz, 10 bucks. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Evan Schultz. Uh, Slav K, five pounds. How does being born again 
in orthodoxy show in life? What are the signs of a person being born again? Well, in orthodox theology, baptism is when you're born again. And you are either faithful to that covenant or you are not. Baptism is the New Testament version of circumcision. That is the entrance into the covenant. And so you are made a partaker of Christ through the ritual of baptism. However, that does not ensure that you will keep the covenant. You must keep the covenant. Does that mean that we're saved by works? No, because the ability to keep the covenant is also part of the life of grace. Now we do, because we have a human will and a human energy proper to us, have a duty to do those things. Our will does have to, as Paul says, become a co-worker with God. Paul says co-workers. Why would any goofy reformed person not accept that we're co-workers? That doesn't detract from the grace of God because God has set it up to where he wants us to cooperate. It's just ridiculous, childish, stupid. Not you, I'm saying the reform stuff. So uh, being born again is baptism. That's why in John 3, when Jesus explains to Nicodemus what being born again is, he talks about being born of the water and the spirit, baptism. Now, does that mean that everybody baptized is going to be elect and faithful? No, because you can not keep the covenant. And if you don't keep the covenant, you are under the covenant curses. Exactly the same as what God expected of Israel. Deuteronomy 28 talks about the covenant blessings and curses. And yes, during that covenant, the emphasis was on the material, but it was still spiritual. Right? So we don't want to fall into Marcionism. We don't want to fall into dispensationalist heresies. In the New Testament period, the emphasis shifts from the physical and the material to the spiritual. Okay, But the spiritual is present in both covenants. The material is present in both the Old and New Testament, Old and New Covenant. The emphasis shifts. We still have the physical in the New Testament. There are still physical blessings. Health is a blessing. It's all in the Orthodox prayers and liturgy that have a blessed long life. God grant you many years. But we also put the emphasis on the spiritual. Not because the physical or the material is bad, but because it's not the most important. But again, the emphasis in the Old Testament, yes, is physical, but the spiritual is still present. In the New Testament, the physical is still there, but the emphasis is on the spiritual. It's that simple. And that's why in Deuteronomy 28, Israel has blessings and cursings. And then you read the Apocalypse, chapters 2 and 3, where Jesus speaks to the seven churches, blessings and cursings, physical and spiritual, present in the blessings and cursings to the seven churches. But the emphasis has changed. There's no other way to make sense of the Old and New Testament. Otherwise, you'll end up in Marcionism or Gnosticism or Dispensationalism, some stupid heresy. Nepco, 10 bucks. What advice would Peterson give manlets besides cleaning the room? I'm taking, I'm talking really short. I'm talking really short. You think he can cheer them up? Well, I mean, I haven't read the book, but I mean, I don't know. He doesn't he list like um, 12, 10 steps of uh, better living, how, how to man up, how to be responsible, that kind of stuff, which is all I'm sure very accurate. Uh, I haven't read the book, uh, but I'm sure like the basic ideas of like, you know, having uh, patterns of regularity in your life. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, what would he give to, what advice would he give? Um, he talks about stuff like facing your demons or something or, or uh, separating yourself from toxic people, not being afraid to do that. Like, you know, he, doesn't he do psychology or whatever? Psychology type stuff. Um, 
not I haven't spent a whole lot of time uh, following Peterson, so I don't I don't know all the steps. Is he an atheist? Uh, he is a Jungian agnostic kind of person. All right. Thank you, guys. That was uh, a lot of fun. Tomorrow, I should be ready tomorrow. I've read a good bit of this ridiculous copra book. Um, and we'll be ready to do the next in the Globalism book series. So, um, turning point. Man. But get ready for uh, vindication on everything I said about dialectics and how dialectics relates directly to the control structures of globalism, not Democrat, Republican stuff. We're talking ecology, geopolitics, Eastern philosophy as a control mechanism. You're going to see that explicitly with, with Capra, with Frito Capra. And he actually talks like a higher pitched Arnold. I thought, I thought it was going to be an Indian dude. He talks like Arnold. I listened to an interview with him. And he talks like a higher pitch Arnold. Fleet of Capra. Staugies. Staugies. It's like Arnold with one little one little tinge of helium. The Staugies. You will say now. The Staugies. Turn that up a little bit with helium, and you've got Frito Capra. Frito Capricorn. Anyway, God bless you guys. Have a good night. Uh, I don't see any more Super Chats. I think we're done. Very generous. I uh, loved it. Uh, you guys are great. I don't know that I can recommend Midsommar. Watch Wicker Man. Everything you need is already in Wicker Man. Pretty good movie. Christopher Lee's a good bad guy in that. Wicker Man's a good movie. Midsommar. Yuck. Gross. Some gross stuff. That's the main thing about Midsommar. Gross. Stranger Things. More to come in the near future. God bless. Have a good night.